Hello, and welcome virtually to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. My name is Christopher Sands, and I'm director of the Canada Institute, and I'm very pleased today to be bringing you a discussion of International Underground Railroad Month, how it happened, why it's important, and what we know now about this important connection between Canada and the United States. We have an excellent panel for you, but I want to begin by ceding the stage to a good friend from the Canadian Embassy, uh, the, uh, who will, uh, our Deputy Chief of Mission, uh, Catherine Baird, with a, who will have a welcome of her own. Thank you, Chris. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to make a few remarks in advance of what I'm sure will be a terrific panel discussion. I'm so proud that Canada has been a partner in events to celebrate International Underground Railroad Month, including this panel today. This is yet another opportunity to highlight the significance of the Underground Railroad and the legacy of freedom seekers in the United States and Canada. I fully appreciate that this month is dedicated to the International Underground Railroad, but we're committed to highlighting this significant piece of history and its freedom seekers well beyond this month, telling stories and weaving lessons and experiences into other events and activities throughout the year. To this end, the Embassy is honoured to partner with the National Park Service on an exhibit titled North is Freedom, the legacy of the Underground Railway. This photographic essay developed by Canadian photographer Yuri Deutsch includes 24 portraits of the Canadian descendants of once enslaved African Americans who sought their freedom in Canada via the Underground Railroad. This exhibit is very dear to our hearts, to my heart. The name of the exhibit, North is Freedom, comes from a poem by George Eliot Clark, Canada's Parliamentary Poet Laureate from 2016 to 2017. In 2016, the Embassy premiered a version of the exhibit in our art gallery to coincide with the opening of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. During our opening night event, we were honored to welcome as our special guests a number of the descendants featured in the exhibit. That night and all it represented remains one of my most special memories of my time here in DC. But back to the present. The National Park Service exhibit launches today on the Park Service website, marking the date Harriet Tubman escaped the Maryland plantation on which she was enslaved. It will run through February 2022, Black History Month. Today's panel is an opportunity to focus on the historical importance of the Underground Railroad to both our countries and to hear personal stories of freedom seeker descendants, including the unimaginable journey their ancestors embarked on and survived to gain freedom. It is these people and their descendants who have contributed in countless ways to the growth and development of Canada as a great nation. The Underground Railroad Network was maintained by abolitionists who were committed to human rights and equality. Individuals who offered help and sanctuary. We can't begin to imagine what people went through on this journey to freedom, but we are truly humbled by the part Canada played. To this day, Canada and the United States remain committed to working together to ensure everyone has access to equal rights and freedoms. The Canada-US relationship is deeply rooted in our shared values and our shared history, and few stories shine a brighter light on this than the Underground Railroad. Thank you for participating in today's events. Enjoy the panel discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, and we're, we're very glad that you were able to participate in our event. And I, I should say, the Wilson Center is very uh, grateful for the Canadian Embassy, for the National Park Service in the United States, our cousins in the Smithsonian institutions, and also uh, Parks Canada for their support and guidance as we pulled together today's panel. But now it's a great privilege for me to introduce the moderator of our panel discussion today, Dr. Spencer Crew. Dr. Crew is a professor of history at George Mason University in Virginia. He is an emeritus director of the National Museum 
of African American history and culture, and he was president, a past president of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, a perfect moderator for what I hope will be a very stimulating panel. Over to you, Professor Crew. Well, thank you so much, Christopher. And it's a real pleasure and honor to be here this afternoon to be a part of this panel. Let me quickly just introduce the other members of the panel so you'll be able to know who they are. They include Dr. Carolyn uh, Frost, G Gordon Barker, Irene Moore Davis, Dr. Brian Walls, Kimberly Simmons, and Fergus Borderwick. And they're all, I think, wonderful individual scholars and ancestors of people connected to the Underground Railroad. And I expect we will have a very lively conversation this afternoon with different perspectives about the Underground Railroad, its meaning, and its importance to people in different kinds of ways. I want to start with a few comments about the Underground Railroad, maybe to give it some context. I think that the Underground Railroad is often an energy, a time in history that is surrounded with a lot of myths and misunderstandings. I like to, when I'm giving lectures to individuals to start off with the idea that the Underground Railroad is not underground and it's not a railroad because that's important to establish because uh, there have been books written lately that tend to make people think that that's the case. So it's important that we understand that that is not the best way to describe this. I, I think it's better to think about the Underground Railroad as a loose network of people from different walks of life who are opposed to enslavement and are willing to, see, to seek freedom themselves or to help freedom seekers gain their freedom. It's important because it's also an interracial uh, operation and it has a long history in both of our nations, which we can be very proud of and really seek to understand better. But there's also no specific date when we can say when the Underground Railroad starts. I think a lot of people offer different ways of considering it. I would suggest that maybe the best way to think about it is that ever from the very beginning, of the system of, of enslavement, there were people who sought freedom and there were people who were willing to help them. And that in some ways is the nascent beginning of the Underground Railroad. It evolves, becomes more sophisticated and more complicated going forward. But when we think about it in its rawest terms, that might be the best way to think about it. And also we wanna keep in mind that people make this decision at a time when their choice is not a safe one. It is one in which they themselves find, can find themselves in danger. And they're actually in the United States going against the federal law, going against the law of the land. There are pieces of legislation like the Fugitive Slave Laws of 1793 and 1850, which will punish those who are seeking freedom, but also those who might decide to dare to help them gain their freedom along the way. So that you're taking a major risk in your own life uh, in the right life of those connected to you to get involved in this operation of helping people gain their freedom and seek their freedom from enslavement. And I think also we have to understand that it's not necessarily a popular point of view in certainly in, in, uh, in the United States and in parts of Canada as well, because there are people who are making their living, their economic uh, well-being is based upon their connection to enslavement. We've had a number of studies begin to emerge about companies and about universities from, for whom enslavement was an important part of their founding and their wealth. Here in Washington, DC, Georgetown University is going through a number of conversations about that. Since in their early years, they were about to uh, uh, suffer financial ruin, they sold enslaved people in order to keep, keep them going forward. So this becomes, I think, an important point of view to maintain as well. I think uh, our keeping that perspective in mind allows us to think about the Underground Railroad in a different kind of way. Not to think of it as a very simple, easy thing to do, but as a very strong, uh, uh, courageous decision made by individuals about trying to create change. Um, I think it's an operation that's worthy of note, both in, um, in nor uh, 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 worthy of note because of its interracial nature and of the courage of the people who are a part of it. But uh, you have a better, an opportunity, I think, to better understand this as our panel uh, unfolds and our panelists are able to share their knowledge and their personal connection to the Underground Railroad story and the people who are part of it. And I'd like to start with a general question and I will look to the members of the panel to speak as you see fit. We'll be sort of, I'd say, Quaker-like in our operation in the sense that as the spirit moves you, please feel free to let me know on the chat and I'll be glad to give you the floor. But what I'd like to start off with is the idea that um, what I've offered is a very quick and easy description of the Underground Railroad. 
And how might you describe its importance as a uh, historical moment for either of our nations, but also for individuals who have been connected to it in one way or the other over the years? So I'd like to know your thoughts about that idea. I'm not seeing anyone volunteering, so I'm going to volunteer you, Carolyn. <laughs> Kimberly, don't laugh. You're next. <laughs> I'm going to actually pass this over to a direct descent, and I think I'd like to hear Kim's what Kim has to say. I got something I want to say at the end of this bit, if I may. Okay. Well, isn't that wonderful? Thank you so much, <laughs> Carolyn, for throwing that ball. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, gosh. So, Spencer, please repeat, since I, I drifted off, please repeat what you would like me to say about this very important uh, okay. piece of who I am. Well, I'm interested. We understand that the Underground Railroad is an important moment in time in history, but I wanted us to reflect about how we should see that in terms of the history of countries, but more importantly, the history of individuals and how it impacts their families and you, their ancestors, in terms of the house that how do you all perceive that particular moment in time in history? Well, I will tell you that I wake up every morning as those that know me well, and this that question um, and the backdrop of that question is, is on my mind probably when I went to sleep at night and wake up mm -hmm. in the morning. I run a nonprofit organization that sprang out of literally my family's story. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as it's tied to both the Canadian side of our Detroit River and the American side of our Detroit River. And for those that are not familiar with uh, the Detroit River region, if you've never been here, uh, I live in Detroit, but I'm a dual citizen. I'm actually a citizen mm -hmm. of Canada as well. Uh, my family, uh, and I'm the product of four freedom seekers, wow. uh, two of which are fairly well known. And uh, the first arrival was in 18, in and about, around 1835. So the family's been here in the Detroit River region for about 186 years or so. Uh, therefore, I would say that we've seen a lot. Um, the history in this particular region is tremendously tied to the story of freedom and justice. Mm -hmm. it, is, mm -hmm. it is because we live uh, on an on a international border. Uh, right. It is extremely significant, um, the story itself, to, to uh, both sides. Um, this, our border, our river, which a 10-year-old told me many years ago when I was doing a uh, a, a tour, Miss Kim, that is not a river, it's a strait. Well, yes, it is. <laughs> so let me explain. <laughs> it connects two bodies together, Lake Erie and Lake St. Clair. Uh, and it is 32 miles long. Wow. And along that 32 mile border, uh, there were what we have approximated about 20, 20 25 thousand people hmm. crossed our strait, oh. our river, to find freedom uh, using the network, as you describe very, very succinctly as the Underground Railroad. And my ancestors were part of that in 1835, the first one. Um, the story of freedom in Detroit is very, very, very tied to our river and to the backdrop of those stories. Even though a lot of the residents and those that visit don't necessarily understand that, uh, but we're trying to change that as we move forward because my family, um, and as I noted, my family, one of the families is named Watkins and Dr. Walls happens to be married to one of them. <laughs> I, I feel sorry for you, but that's okay. Here we are. Uh, <laughs> Uh, those Watkins women's are, are something else. Anyway, um, our family story is inextricably tied to our river. Sure. Okay. Um, it, it truly is. 
Okay. So it, it's uh, an ex- it's it's extremely important every day, okay. all day to me. Gotcha. Well, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, are you still going to pass, or you want to speak now? You're you're muted. Because there's several representatives here, people I know very well from the Detroit River region, I wanted to introduce another piece of the Underground Railroad story and some of the people in it, if I may. And that's the Niagara border, which has been very much less studied, despite the fact that that's where Frederick Douglass sent people across, and it's also where Harriet Tubman crossed. Um, And in recent uh, years, I have been involved with a project at the Cataract House Hotel, which is an archaeological excavation. I'm thinking I think I'm the only archaeologist in Canada with a doctorate Mm. in the history of race and slavery. Mm. Um, So I have another perspective and I write fugitive slave biography. I don't call them fugitive slaves anymore. I use the term because it's what most people recognize right now. But I prefer freedom seekers and I'm sure everybody else here does too. Uh, I write biographies of people who sought freedom in Canada and one of them was called Steal Away Home. And it's about a woman by the name of Cecilia Jane Reynolds who fled her Louisville people who claimed her free, claimed her service from um, as they visited Niagara Falls. And she stayed with them at the Cataract House Hotel, the Cataract House Hotel being not only a very famous hotel in the area, but the largest and most important underground railroad station on the Niagara wow. frontier, because the waiters and chambermaids and all the, the staff who were seasonal at the Cataracta House helped people get to freedom across that river. And Cecilia came to Toronto. She was helped by a man who became, he was a, a freedom seeker himself, but he was a waiter on the steamboats and was a conductor on the underground railroad in his own right. The Underground Railroad Heritage Commission of the City of Niagara Falls, the Archaeological Survey of the University of Buffalo, and um, (laughs) the um, Underground Railroad Center at uh, Niagara Falls, which I think is the only museum, the Underground Railroad, right on the border, Mm. uh, come together over the last several years to work on a big archaeological dig, just plaque the site, and uh, just to close the story, because this is a binational story, Cecilia came to Toronto where she lived with the man she married in a house behind City Hall, Toronto's iconic semi-circular sections in City Hall. And that site of her home was excavated in 2015 when the province of Ontario decided to build a new courthouse there. So we have both ends of the story with archeology. span And I've just been speaking with Diane Miller, who's the head of the, the Freedom, of course, with the US Park Service about the sister site project, because we're hoping to twin the story of Cecilia from both sides of the border, linking the two archeological sites. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Walls, would you like to sort of talk a little bit about it, the, the importance of the Underground Railroad from your context? Thank you very much, Dr. Pru. Uh, in, in general, I'd have to say that the, uh, the Underground Railroad uh, was the first great freedom movement in the Americas. It was the first time that good people, black and white of different races and faiths, worked in harmony for freedom and for justice. And if they did it way back then, we can do it today. You know, from a personal point of view, I consider the Underground Railroad a neutral history. I say that because it is a multicultural history, multiracial history, and uh, uh, it doesn't point fingers. That's what's so beautiful about it. It's a story of liberation, and all of humankind are part of that, uh, that, that equation of freedom. And it's a much needed theme and message for today. It's a message of mutual respect, Dr. Crew, of reconciliation, leaving bitterness behind and keeping love in our hearts for one another. And so as uh, perhaps a, the most elderly one of, of the panel, I, I just share that thought uh, uh, and, uh, and it comes straight from my, my mind and my heart. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you. Uh, Fergus, I'm interested in your thoughts around this. You've done quite a bit of writing about this. Um, wh- what is your perspective? You're, you're muted. Not anymore. No. Uh, thank you, Spencer. And, and I also want to thank uh, the Canadian Embassy and the Wilson Center for making this, this possible. Um, uh, I, I think uh, what I'd like to do is try to put the Underground Railroad in a somewhat broader 
context. I mean, other people can speak from their from their hearts and 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 uh, inherited memory of, of of much more personal experiences. Um, now, you know, I, I think the Underground Railroad, as you yourself pointed out earlier, Spencer, is saturated with myths. Uh, false myths that distorted the way we tend to think about it, and uh, it, um, w which is a result really of the of the long Jim Crow era when the true history of the Underground Railroad and its significance, and especially its biracial nature, yeah, nature uh, right. uh, sunk beneath the waves of forgetfulness, uh, and we were left with these folk stories of funny hidey holes and and even the crazy right. notion that it right. was something that ran underground and so on and so on. Uh, but in both the US and Canada, I mean, th this, this thing we call the Underground Railroad had tremendous significance, much more than it has often been credited yeah. with in the United States, as uh, Dr. Walls uh, uh, just said, and I agree, the Underground Railroad uh, it's much more significant than its fictions. It had far-reaching political and moral consequences. Uh, it was the United States' first interracial movement, uh, and indeed uh, intensely interracial, with uh, uh, Black Americans often sharing, a sharing equal responsibility for making the system work. Often, many, many Underground Railroad Call them what you will, cells, units, up local operations, and it was highly localized. We should probably point out mm -hmm. that there was no great hierarchy, there was no president of the Underground Railroad, and so on. Highly localized. But many, many groups were primarily African American. Many were not. Many, many, many were mixed. And in fact, it was this synergy between blacks and whites that made it work, that made it possible for it to succeed. And uh, uh, besides delivering tens of thousands, we don't know really how many, but right. tens of thousands of uh, fugitive slaves, freedom seekers, as you will, uh, to safety in the North and Canada, uh, over time, it had a tremendous influence on public opinion across the North mm -hmm. by delivering former slaves into what had been simply white communities. For the first time, countless Northerners encountered slaves and heard in a personal way what the experience of slavery was. People who never really thought seriously about abolitionism became abolitionists by listening to uh, the reports of fugitive slaves. On the Canadian end, and I will always bow to Carolyn talking about Canada, uh, but, but nonetheless, I, I think it's worth saying that uh, we, especially down here in the States, tend to think of the Underground Railroad as ending at the Canadian border. But in fact, uh, uh, Canada was a beginning. Canada was a beginning for, for former slaves who arrived there uh, and were able to reinvent or, or let's say create lives in freedom for the first time, where even if prejudice existed. Nonetheless, the law, the law uh, was on the whole uh, very fair and, 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 and equitable in Canada. And if you read the stories, uh, the reports, historical reports of former slaves who settled in Canada, they, they, own pro they, they, they acquire property, they start businesses, uh, they start careers, they make money. And for the first time in North America, uh, Black North Americans, because they're Canadians by now, uh, North Americans are able to shape their own futures based on their own desires oh, and ideals. Mm -hmm. And this is really, in Canada, the fruit of the Underground Railroad, which is somewhat, is, is also true of those more larger numbers of fugitives, freedom seekers, who stayed in the free states in the North, but we're still typically constrained right. by discriminatory law. So I, I, I think uh, you know, there is a, this is a great movement that's taking place that has a political, a moral, uh, and a profound human dimension as well.
Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I think we don't value enough the impact of this movement. And that's why we're here today. Uh, uh, Irene Davis, I, I, do you have some thoughts you'd like to share with us? I do. I mean, I echo everything that the previous panelists have said thus far, but I just want to add, you know, as you mentioned, there are so many misunderstandings, so many mythologies around it. And what I always stress to my students and to anyone to whom I'm speaking is the involvement and the engagement and the initiative taking of the freedom seekers themselves. You know, that right. Underground Railroad right. story that we so often hear, that, that uh, pervasive narrative is sort of a, these um, kindly abolitionists handing mm -hmm. people from point A to point B and mm -hmm. steering them and, and transporting them. And, and I know that some of the coded language that was used to protect identities and so on has played a role in creating those mythologies. But we can never fail to be amazed, astonished, and so inspired by the, the creativity and determination and passion and courage and critical mm -hmm. thinking mm -hmm. of these individuals who made this journey. And these self-emancipated freedom seekers, formerly enslaved individuals, they're really a big part of the story that's missing and we need they to are. place them at the center. So yes. that, you know, that's the work that I hope this month will encourage us all to undertake. But you know, the Underground Railroad in terms of its importance, it's such an important piece of the story of Canada. You know, I am Canadian, though I love my friends, relatives and neighbors <laughs> in Detroit and, and surrounding areas. Um, it's so important and it really uh, is part of, of what creates our sense of Canadian identity. And it's one of the things that we cling to the most when we're looking for good news stories of our past. But we also have a tendency here to ignore, uh, once again, the initiative taking and the hard work and the effort and the uh, frankly inspired endeavors of these individuals once they crossed into Canada and established these new lives. And there's this pervasive mythology that they had it easy and that Canada was just so welcoming. And, and so we have to kind of correct that narrative too. So it's a really, it's a work in progress, making sure that the truth of the Underground Railroad is told. Yeah, no, I agree. I, and I particularly agree with your first part about the need to highlight the role of freedom seekers themselves. Uh, it's always interesting when you are talking to a group, I often ask them, so what's the most important element of the Underground Railroad? And you'll hear abolitionists, secrecy, hiding places. And then you say, no, you need freedom seekers. If they don't have any freedom seekers, the rest of it doesn't happen, it doesn't matter. And it's really important, as you said, that we bring them to the forefront so we understand how critical and how central they are to this experience. Mr. Baker. Oh, Mr. Barker, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't want to leave you out. No. Um, well, first, first of all, I want to thank uh, thank uh, the Wilson Center and uh, everybody who's in, been involved in putting this together. Um, I guess I would pick up off uh, the word center, which Irene has mentioned. And I think I, I want to try to place the Underground Railroad in a, in a historiographical con, uh, context. And you, Spencer, I, I think you started off on it. And I think it will really underscore the importance of the Underground Railroad. In most of my writing, I've argued that um, the American Revolution did not finish in uh, 1781, nor in 1783. Um, and this is something we, we, we've really got to remember. It was an unfinished American Revolution. And I would like to try to place the Underground Railroad in that context. Um, the role of the Underground Railroad then um, becomes much more important. As you said before, it, it was a network, but I would like to take it beyond just being a network. Uh, it was more than a smattering of safe houses on, on a landscape, uh, a landscape where activists shelter, sheltered freedom seekers. Rather, I think we've got to think of the Underground Railroad as an agent or an instrument to finish that American Revolution. And an, an instrument of liberation. Uh, and it was transnational working together, activists in America, 
in Canada, mm -hmm. even overseas in Europe. Um, they were basically a community of remarkable people, a biracial community uh, seeking to advance the cause of freedom. And so the Underground Railroad then becomes, becomes from that point of view, a community of remarkable biracial, a biracial community of remarkable activists that are going to work for the cause of freedom. And they also end up putting the dramas of freedom seekers on center stage. And this is incredibly important. If you look at the William and Ellen Craft uh, drama, look at the Shadrach drama, look at the Anthony Burns drama. And so from that point of view, and here I go to some of the remarks Fergus was making about abolitionism, rather than necessarily the, the William Lloyd Garrisons, the activists on the Underground Railroad and the freedom seekers themselves become perhaps the greatest abolitionists pushing <clears throat> for freedom. And uh, looking at the Underground Railroad from that context, it becomes way more than uh, a myth of scattered houses and, and uh, abolitionists. It becomes a movement that begins to drive, as you said, from the moment slavery uh, takes hold in America until freedom is achieved. And it is even important in today's context as, as Brian mentioned as well. Thank you. Does anyone else have more to add on this? Because I have a, a, a next question, but I want to make sure everyone has felt they had a chance to share. If not, the other thought I had was that um, one of the things I think that makes the Underground Railroad story so powerful and I think so impactful for people are the individual stories and moments that happen that we find in terms of the research we've done or our family uh, lore that we have. And I'd like you all to pause for a minute and think about what is there a particular event or a, a story about the Underground Railroad that you think people should know to really get a feel for its importance and its impact, uh, short term and long term. I mean, uh, 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 yes, Carol, you, you're muted. Yes, I can't help it. I have to do this because in this picture behind me, in the center of the picture, people can see a yellow carriage, and that is the first taxi in Toronto. Um, Toronto was a very important center of the Underground Railroad because it was the pivot between British and American abolitionism. Everybody met there to talk about abolitionism, black and white. Not everybody, but it was a very interesting uh, crux of that. And um, the story of Thornton and Lucy Blackburn really speaks to both the meaning of the Underground Railroad in the past, and it also speaks to its implications for the present and the future. So I'm going to be really quick. But I'd like to say, because some of you have heard this before, that um, in 1985, I was excavating downtown Toronto and came across the first underground railroad site ever dug in Canada. And that was a home of a couple named Lucy and Thornton Blackburn. And I wrote a book about their lives and there's other work coming out right now. But the Blackburn story has become the iconic story for the Underground Railroad in Toronto, but it links to Detroit and it also links mm -hmm. to Kentucky very directly. Um, and I'm doing a children's book to show those links right now. But the Blackburns came to Canada by way, from Kentucky by way of Detroit where they were captured. And they were rescued in the first racial riots in the city of Detroit, which was the only single major event in their lives that actually had a history that was remembered in history. And what we have to do so often with freedom seeker stories is bring them back to light. And it took me 20 years to bring the, the mm. black Earth story to light. Oh, wow. When, when they came to Canada, and I'll be really, I don't want to take up everybody's time, but when they came to Canada, they were captured at the border at the request of the mayor of Detroit, who right. said that they had incited the very uncivil unrest that had rescued them. They were jailed in the Sandwich, which is very close to Windsor now. It's part of Windsor, Ontario now. And they were the demand was that they would be extradited on the part, extradited back to the United States on the part of the acting governor of Michigan. Here's the implication for today. 
The upper Canadian government, what is now Ontario, not all of Canada, just what is now Ontario, created the first Canadian refugee reception policy to protect the Blackburns, and it remains the foundation of our extradition laws to this day. The lieutenant governor mm -hmm. said, modern implications, the lieutenant governor said, we cannot return them to a jurisdiction where they're going to be enslaved because that's not a punishment under Canadian law. And to this day, we do not extradite people to places that where torture and execution are likely to happen to them for this reason. And everybody missed that it's an underground railroad mm -hmm. route to that extradition law. And I wanted to say that. Oh, so, thank you. That's, that's terrific. Uh, others of you, other family lore, are there stories you found in your research that particularly resonated for, me, for you that helped give you and would give others a, a sense of the Underground Railroad's impact on a big level or on even on a, a family level? Yes, Dr. Walls. Yes, uh, I, I get passionate about um, my own particular family story, but uh, there's certainly, uh, my, my ancestors weren't famous uh, uh, travelers on the Underground Railroad. However, uh, they were touched by people like the, the great uh, Henry Bibb, who uh, came into to Canada. And in 1844, uh, he sent a letter back to his uh, old slave master. And he says, you may think hard of us from running away from slavery, to be, but to be compelled to stand by and see you whip and lash my wife without mercy drove me to seek a better home for my family. Henry Bibb, Windsor, Ontario, 1844. And it really inspired me to, to want to know more about my ancestors, John Freeman Walls and Jane King Walls. And at the entrance, I won't get long-winded, at the entrance to the John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railroad Museum, there's a historic plaque which reads, in 1846, John Freeman Walls, a fugitive enslaved from North Carolina, built a log cabin on land purchased from the Refugee Home Society, an organization founded by the abolitionist Henry Bibb, publisher of The Voice of the Fugitive and the famous Josiah Henson. The cabin subsequently served as a terminal of the Underground Railroad and the first meeting place of the Puce Baptist Church. Although many former enslaved returned to the United States following the American Civil War, Walls and his family chose to remain in Canada. The story of their struggles forms the basis of the book, The Road That Led to Somewhere, which I was inspired to pen. And I couldn't have done it unless I had a Rio of my family by the name of Aunt Stella Butler, uh, who I purchased the ancestral homestead from in 1976. She passed away in 1986 at 102 Ooh. years of age, but her mind was sharp right up mm -hmm. in, until the end. And, and it underscores the, 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 the fact that, that others have brought out, you know, how it's so important to, to, to recognize uh, those who were uh, maybe not famous uh, travelers on the underground right. railroad but made great contributions. Uh, every good story has a beginning, middle and end. And yes. the story that ends in Canada uh, is, is certainly there to, to, to put the uh, book in uh, to the overall Underground Railroad freedom movement. Mm -hmm. And I'll maybe talk more about that at a later date, but I want to give other people a chance to, to, to share their thoughts so we can all learn. I have a quick question. It's just my curiosity. And then uh, Kimberly, I, I, I promise to get to you. So do you still have contact with relatives back in uh, North, North Carolina? Are you referring to me, uh, Doctor? Yeah, 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 yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm just sort of curious. Uh, well, yes, we, uh, my my ancestors came from Rockingham County uh, on a little creek called Troublesome Creek, and uh, uh, my my wife and I and we've been back there and and uh, and, and made some contact uh, with some relatives. And because it is a uh, an interracial story as well, mm -hmm. a stranger than fiction story. For the time that uh, that the the John Freeman Walls and Jane King Walls did this, uh, we were uh, uh, able to make some contacts, but uh, very uh, uh, but with great discretion to the descendants of uh, uh, Jane King Walls, who was Irish and Scottish. Okay, 
Thank you. Uh, Kimberly, I, first of all, please forgive me. I will refer to you by your first names and it's not out of disrespect. It's, it just uh, seems easier for me to make sure I'm identifying the right person. So Kimberly, please. Yes, I. Um, it's funny you, you asked that question. My family uh, story keeps cropping up, I guess you would say. It, it, mm. it reappears out of the blue. Um, I got a, I got a call, uh, about a month and a half ago. Uh, it was actually, it wasn't a call. It was an email. And one of those anonymous emails that sometimes you just ignore. Right. And this one was from a artist. Her name is, uh, Rasha Fowler. And it stated that, and again, I had never met her. She lives in LA. Um, and she said that she was doing an exhibit uh, creating a uh, piece for an exhibit in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, that is to debut literally Saturday, two days from now, oh, okay. uh, that is dedicated to Carolyn Quarles Watkins, which is my third mm. great grandmother. And she, she arrived uh, in um, Sandwich, which Carolyn has mentioned, and uh, one of her granddaughters, Brian, is married to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> along with myself in 1840 in 1843 and i will tell you that 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 was a stun it was stunning but i guess i'm kind of used to it because things keep happening I, I keep things keep tying back to that to my and to our mm -hmm. story um i am honored i was asked to come uh in in uh, rashad's stead because she is uh, actually uh, a midwife as well and is delivering a baby oh, okay. uh, this weekend. She's, she's not going to be able to attend. So she asked uh, the gallery to actually uh, invite me um, and to come in and actually uh, represent the family. Uh, the gallery in St. Louis is called the Luminary and it, it, uh, it, the, the uh, exhibit is called Women in Practice. Practice. Uh, tied back to uh, women, freedom, and uh, the story of women in Missouri history. Well, how did she find my family story? She literally did a Google search. Oh. And I guess searched great women in, in St. Louis. And my ancestor, Carolyn Quarles, became Carolyn Quarles Watkins, was literally born in St. Louis in 1826 on the corner of Sixth and Pine, which if you've never been to St. Louis, it's about three blocks from the Mississippi and the Arch. Mm. And so her story uh, starts there, leading from the home that she was born in as the uh, granddaughter of her owner, uh, the daughter of one of his sons and one of the other enslaved in the home. Her name was Maria, I speak her name. She's my fourth grade grandmother. And her, her thousand mile trek to Detroit and across the river, the Windsor and Sandwich. So I will say that this story, um, Midway stops in Milwaukee and it involves a sugar barrel. And as the story is told in quite a few books, one of which is co-edited by the great Carolyn Smarts Frost, um, <laughs> called A Fluid Frontier, I will speak its name because Irene Moore Davis actually is a collaborator as well. Uh, <laughs> I will say that um, uh, the, the sugar barrel was a place of hiding in Milwaukee, downtown mm. on Riverfront, which is Wisconsin and Water Street, which if you've ever been to Milwaukee is Main, Main Street, Main Downtown Street. And uh, she was hidden from bounty hunters that were right on her tail all the way mm. from St. Louis in a sugar barrel, hidden in plain, plain sight, as the story is told. And uh, she uh, survived that, was rescued by other people within the town she had been in for a couple of weeks, had literally been hiding in plain sight, uh, and was welcomed as the first documented escape through the state of Wisconsin using the Underground Railroad. Mm. Well, when, Miss, uh, when Rasha called me to tell me that she was doing this exhibit and this is what she had decided to do and they had, she had asked that they send for me and would I go. Uh, she described what she was doing 
And I started tearing up because she told me mm -hmm. her representation of my family story. She was literally carving a barrel. Oh. The barrel, instead of it being a place of hiding, which is what it was used for in Milwaukee to hide her for, for 18 hours, literally was being carved into a seat, a place of rest. Uh -huh. hmm. And so what was a place that uh, was for escape and was to, to hide her has not, will now become officially a place of rest. And I will tell you, she is not honored in St. Louis. And as a matter of fact, uh, Saturday when I go to the when I arrive in St. Louis and go to this event, will be the first time that anybody in the family has actually taken this journey. And mm. I am truly looking forward to it because I will tell you, Spencer Crew, that uh, the gentleman where I'm staying and his wife is Vincent DeForest. I am staying with Vince, mm. and. Uh, uh, meeting a, a bunch of people that apparently have wanted to meet the end of this story. The because the, oh. Ryan and I are on one end and they're on the beginning of the mm. end of the journey. So I um to say that wow. this the Underground Railroad keeps popping up. Yes, because it was <laughs> the beginning of the civil rights movement. Right, it right. keeps popping up for right. a reason. Right. For a reason. Right. And, so, and why why it has resonance even today. Absolutely, and that's why. Um, we just completed a transnational curriculum, first of mm. its kind mm. in, in the world. I don't say United States, in the world, because uh, we did a, we created a curriculum with the University of Michigan, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about it uh, later on. Uh, but it is intended to be you, to be, um, uh, the curriculum is intended that bo both Canadian children, school kids, and American school kids at the same time will be doing the same lesson talking about their own history, which is a mirror of each other, because our countries are mirrored in this freedom story. So maybe we can discuss that a little bit further along the way. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Uh, Irene, did you have uh, things you wanted to add? Yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to focus on just one story, so I'm right, going to kind right. of twist my answer a bit, but I mean, so personally, I'm descended from multiple Underground Railroad uh, uh, traveling families, and I'm so um, honored and pleased every time I think about uh, their courage and, mm. and sacrifice and everything that they did uh, coming from Tennessee, from uh, from uh, uh, North Carolina, from Kentucky, especially from Virginia, you know, so many amazing stories. But what always really gets to the heart of the significance of, the, of these stories for me is how well they were able to restructure their lives and, and live in freedom once they arrived here and how well so many of their kids did. That second generation of Underground mm -hmm. Railroad Travelers, that's where I love to put my focus. And I find when I'm talking to uh, various audiences, it's often new Canadians, newcomers, immigrants who respond most to these stories because they see in these stories the kind of hope, especially that they want to hold for their children um, in this new uh, country. So, so I mean, just to, to touch on three, <laughs> not taking up too much time, you know, I think about uh, my enslaved ancestors, the Duns, who were in Frankfurt, Kentucky, and made their way here by way of Ohio and, and, uh, and ended up, you know, successful working, he was working as a barber, he was very involved in the community. His children went on to do very well. His son, James, became Windsor's first black school board trustee and town counselor and a pretty wealthy man with the paint and varnish factory um, and the new public school in our city that's opening next year will be named James L. Dunn oh. Public School. Well, I mean, I think about uh, a younger son, my great great grandfather, who became Windsor's first black mayoral candidate in 1896. Like mm. these are things 
that really speak to the heart of what underground railroad stories are all about, that these individuals had just as much talent and intellect and ability where they were, but that act of seizing themselves and liberating themselves and, and moving themselves to a new location where they could live in freedom made all the difference for their families. And That's if I huge. think about a couple of stories that are not involving my own relatives, I think about Delos Rogers Davis, who comes here as a child on the Underground Railroad and becomes Canada's first Underground Railroad traveler to become an attorney um, here in, in Ontario. Amazing. I think about Elijah McCoy, who was born to formerly enslaved people from Kentucky in 1843, mm -hmm. right here in Essex County, and goes on to become one of the greatest inventors and studies mechanics mechanical engineering and has 57 patents to his name. I mean, that's mm. what that's what this history is all about. The possibility that these folks opened up for themselves and for their families. Yeah, yeah. And how important a change in venue is in terms of opportunities you're describing. Because we have to wonder if that would happen had they remained in the United States. Even if they'd stayed in the North, would that have had the same kind of opportunity? Either Fergus or Gordon, um, are there particular stories that resonated for you as you looked at this um, um, institution? Uh, th thank you, Spencer. That, that is an extremely challenging question because there are so many. <laughs> there are so many. And as Irene vividly portrayed, <laughs> they're legion. They're legion. And particularly in Canada, you're right. Uh, of course, there are uh, former enslaved people who come north on the Underground Railroad who make perfectly good lives for themselves in the northern states. But there is always that, that, that shadow, or more than a shadow, those constraints of institutionalized racism in much of the north, or if it's not institutionalized, at least social constraints that hold people back. It's not universal. universal. But the, but the record in Canada is remarkable. It proves uh, a great deal about human potential when it's when it's genuinely yeah, liberated. Right. So, right. As I said, there there's a multitude of stories, but uh, uh, they're kind of tumbling over one uh, each other in my head. <laughs> but I, I I want to mention a man who gets almost no ink. An extraordinary man, Jermaine Logan, or Logwin. L -O -G -U -N -N. Mm -hmm. I thought about him, yes. Okay, uh, who's an extraordinary individual, a contemporary of Frederick Douglass, uh, somewhat overshadowed by Douglass, who um, mm -hmm. uh, escaped from slavery in Tennessee, made his way uh, north to Canada, an extraordinary journey, one of these you can't believe he succeeded stories. Uh, he, he, he published an autobiography. It's very hard to read, but it does exist. It's online. And there's a biography, which is maybe not an optimal biography. He's waiting for a, a better one. But he wound up, he lived in Canada, in, in Canada West uh, for a while. Then he went back to the United States. And I'm, I, that's one reason I want to mention him, because many people who went to Canada returned to the US, yeah, yeah. stay in Canada. They had their own personal reasons. Canada, it was the climate. Or wages, in right. fact, were higher in New York State, at least, than they were in Canada. Um, people might be closer to family and so on. People had their own, their own reasons. Jermaine Logan was one of them. And he uh, wound up becoming a Methodist minister, eventually a bishop, mm -hmm. much later, uh, uh, settled in Syracuse, New York where he became the anchor of the Underground Railroad in Syracuse, New York. And he was a bold, incredibly brave individual who publicly mm -hmm. defied his, his former enslavers to come and get him. Uh, and he advertised his home in Syracuse newspapers as the center of the Underground Railroad in Syracuse. And this is true, by the way. Now, after the fugitive slave law was passed uh, in 1850, he again fled to Canada for a while, and then he returned to the United States, which also reflects quite a few personal stories mm -hmm. of those who, who fled the uh, Fugitive Slave uh, Act of that year. And uh, uh, so, I mean, I, I find him a complicated character in the context of the Underground Railroad. 
very significant figure, helped hundreds and hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. um, do you think the Underground Railroad was always clandestine? Well, in Syracuse, it wasn't. It wasn't right. It wasn't at all. And we, we say it isn't a, wasn't a railroad. Well, except Logan put people on the railroad and send them to Buffalo. <laughs> uh, and, and so on. And, and uh, uh, his outspokenness, I think, looks forward uh, toward the coming generations uh, of black public figures, uh, civil rights activists, uh, and, and a tone of defiance that becomes much more familiar in the 20th century and yeah. is not unknown by any means in the 19th. But Logan, I, I, I think Logan is one of those yeah. people who mm -hmm. like Tubman mm -hmm. and, and Douglas and, and others, we all really ought to know about because More about. He, he was a great figure in his own right. Yes. I, I would agree. Gordon? Uh, Spencer, uh, I, I, I guess I'd respond to that uh, a little bit along the lines of uh, what Irene said. And I'm, um, I, I, as an educator, I think it's important that we get these stories out there. Uh, in my survey courses, uh, and probably Carolyn does the same thing, I try to introduce many of these stories of the remarkable, the passion, the courage, um, the really gripping stories of these uh, incredibly remarkable people. Uh, so I tell the stories of William and Ellen Craft. I tell the stories of Shadrach Minkins. I, t I talk about the Jerry re rescue that Fergus was just uh, was mentioning. And the more we get these stories out there, uh, quite naturally, we're going to bring the dramas of the freedom seekers to central stage in American and Canadian history. And uh, I think this is what we, how we we can do this as educators Haters. and in invariably I get students in my survey classes or upper level classes uh, wanting to know more the good the bad stories the the, the horrible stories the Margaret Garner story uh, as well as the successful stories and uh, in this way I think we we bring the Underground Railroad and its importance uh, out front right. For, for the current generation. Okay, good. The, the thought that occurred to me, uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts around this. So what impact does the Underground Railroad have in the United States? And what impact does it have in Canada? Or does it have none at all? I'm sort of curious about what your sense of all that is. I mean, yes, Kimberly. Well, as I to, just to piggyback on what Gordon and uh, Fergus just mentioned, and of course, uh, Irene, um, the education fact. Okay. Um, as I mentioned a little bit uh, a little while ago, uh, for the last year, we've been working on a uh, transnational curriculum uh, with the University of Michigan in partnership uh, and have come up with quite a product. Um, it is a uh, 10, it is a 10 story case study on the Underground Railroad and the fact that it is a transnational yes, story. Yes. It belongs to more than one country. It does not belong to the United States. It does not belong to Canada. It does not belong in the Caribbean, uh, the, the diaspora. It is transnational in scope. It is the universal story of freedom. And what the curriculum has broken down is 10 case studies, uh, one of which will go back to the Blackburns that's used as uh, one of the pieces, uh, which that story starts in Kentucky and runs all the way to Toronto. Uh, so it, it takes apart all the stories. The uh, mm -hmm. curriculum itself is intended for the middle grades uh, for students. And as I had said a little earlier, it's intended to be taught in more than one country uh, at the same time. So you, in essence, would have some teacher, uh, educator in uh, Windsor, Ontario, or perhaps in Toronto, we'll say. And then someone in Detroit or Gross Point, which is further down our river, or maybe in one of the suburbs of, we'll say, Southfield, Farmington Hills, which is further away from the river teaching at the same time, 
uh, in Michigan, the fifth grade gets uh, history and the eighth grade gets history. Fifth grade is local history and eighth grade is national history. So in Canada, it's seventh grade. But at the same time, you're going to be giving these kids the thought, getting it into them that their story is not local and it's not, it's not here. They're, they are connected to everybody. We are connected to everybody. And the fact that we have an international border, our stories mirror each other because they have for two centuries, okay. our, the stories of both sides. It just depends on your viewpoint, what happened. Yeah, right. And using uh, the black story, you get the viewpoint of the, the American side and the trials and the tribulations of what happened to the black ferns and then reflects just as Carolyn's background shows the story of, uh, of uh, uh, Thornton Blackburn becoming the first cab owner in the country of Canada. And that started on the banks of the uh, uh, river in Louisville. So it, it, it gives, it gives um, and not only do we share that curriculum and okay, we'll do it. No, the kids will be able to interact both across borders together talking about their own story. It's their story. So it's an international, we need to understand that the Underground Railroad was not owned, we'll say, by one country or by one group of people. It was multicultural. It was international in scope. It was a movement, the first movement toward civil rights in the world. Wow. And it is owned by everybody. We need to know that story to understand as we go forward in the world now, wh where that story fits in. You know, it's not like a little myth, myth we put on the shelf and we pull it down sometime. No, no, this, this still connects. As I said, out of the blue, I'm going to a, an event in St. Louis about something that happened in tied to my family and tied to the Underground Railroad history 186 years ago. So what are, you know, it's it's amazing what still crops up. It's relevant. It has never stopped being relevant. So. I think that's true. Yes, Dr. Brian. Yes, thank, thank you, Dr. Crew. Uh, I, I'm excited at the same time with a little levity and, and uh, with seriousness as well. I, I, I say to, uh, uh, to, to Kimberly, that uh, uh, when she mentions that uh, we're related to on, on the Watkins side, we are, uh, but it, it actually doesn't come through my wife because my cousin Jerry Walls is um, uh, married to Heidi Watkins, as you know, right. and, and that's that's where there's a connection. Okay. And I just wanted to interject that. So, so, so my, my, my wife, Anna Davis Walls doesn't bop me in the head. That's and, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, just a little levity uh, and, and loosen things up there. But in terms of the relevance of the Underground Railroad, I, I will talk a little more serious uh, and, and really pay a tribute to the fact that for 14 years, uh, Mrs. Rosa Parks uh, and her Pathway to Freedom students would come to our historic site, mm. uh, bringing students that she was training in the philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King peaceful nonviolence for change. And I say that to say this uh, in terms of your, your question, uh, 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 Dr. Crew, of, of how this story is so relevant, you know, across the, the 49th parallel. And, mm -hmm. and when, when these students would come, busloads, uh, we'd often, often ask them, well, what do you think about the Underground Railroad? You've had a tour up to this point, what's your feeling? And sometimes they'd be very transparent with us and they would say, well, what, what, what's this old time day stuff have to do with me today? I'm free. And we'd look at each other and, and smile. And I remember even looking at Mrs. Rosa Parks herself and smiling and asking, asking the students the question, uh, are there any modern day enslavers? And they'd look, wonder what I'd be talking about and, and others were touring and seek the feedback from them. And then all of a sudden, in a constructivist learning per perspective, they would start to say, well, are there any modern day enslavers? And then all of a sudden, they would say, drugs. And then <laughs> drug addiction. Then they would say incarceration. Then they would say hatred, violence, 
poor self-esteem, bullying. If you don't love yourself, how in the world are you going to love someone else? So as it says in, in the Bible, there will come a time, and you know, as our ancestors did and, and, and others, uh, first thing they did when they came to Canada is they would kneel down and kiss the ground and thank the good Lord that they were free. On, and, they, and they wouldn't build beer parlors, they would build churches. And, and that's, that's for another time uh, and the discussion. However, that spiritual aspect is, is one of the driving aspects that, that, that allows us to feel as descendants, as direct descendants. I'm fifth generation. We go up to around eight, nine generations now. But the bottom line is, is, is that's why I, I want to uh, uh, leave and, and why what everyone else has said, and certainly Kimberly and, and Irene about the importance of education and how this story of the Underground Railroad can, can be used and underscore the fact that there, there's an old saying about democracy may not be the best form of government, but show me a better. Mm -hmm. Canada and the United States, they still have problems in terms of race relations, systemic racism, and other areas. But I personally feel, and I certainly don't have the privilege to speak for all descendants of the Underground Railroad, but I do as a recipient of the Order of Canada and Order of Ontario uh, have the privilege to say that as far as I'm concerned, personally, and I know I speak for many of my family members, that there's no better country in the world for visible minorities to live than in Canada and the United States, as long as we don't let a tyrant get into power and take <laughs> us back to where we've come from. And, 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 the, and we, we, won't, we don't want to start another abolitionist movement uh, anytime in any place. We want to be able to give God the glory every single Sunday. Yeah. Well, Fergus, uh, would you like to offer comments? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, as I think, uh, and this panel is, is in a sense, this event is a representation of what I'm going to say. Uh, the Underground Railroad over, over the last 20 years or so has been pulled out of the realm of myth into the realm of history. And uh, about 20 odd years ago, I, I, I wrote a book called Bound for Canaan, uh, which is a his serious history of the Underground Railroad. At the time, and I don't say this to be self-referential, at the time, it was the first serious history of the Underground Railroad to have been written since 1898 by Wilbur Siebert. And in these 20 years, there's been a tremendous proliferation of books about the Underground Railroad, uh, all kinds of books, including, in my opinion, the best, which are localized, and I, I don't mean yeah. hyper-local, but, but the Underground Railroad is diverse, far-flung, um, and, and local, and therefore, it were, to, to understand it in its operation and in its human dimension, it really has to be studied uh, locally. You have to understand what happened in towns in Indiana or uh, 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 New Jersey and Pennsylvania and so on and so on and so on. Okay. There have been so many books. There are, there are uh, uh, scholars at universities scattered all over the northern states studying the Underground Railroad, thinking about the Underground Railroad. Um, uh, we have the Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati. Now, uh, a, a new museum uh, dedicated in part to the Underground Railroad is being built, as we speak, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, right. uh, in the home of uh, the great abolitionist Thaddeus Stevens. Uh, and there are other such sites. The uh, network of, of Underground Railroad related sites in the United States has been steadily expanding over 20 years. So, uh, you know, we can on one hand, regret that for so long, the truth of the Underground Railroad, as has been so eloquently expressed by everybody on this panel, that the truth was forgotten, but it's being right. recovered. Right. It's being recovered, it's being delivered in schools, on every level of school, from, from grammar school uh, to, to university, uh, treated seriously, recognized as the movement that it was, not just a bunch of kind of quaint stories. So I, I think we're in a, dare I say, 
a, a golden age of renewed consciousness mm -hmm. of what it was and what it meant Perfect. in terms of the great uh, dimension of enlarging freedom in our, in our culture. Yeah. Gordon, any thoughts? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll put out uh, a, a little story very quickly. Okay. okay. Um, uh, and it relates to the question of the relevance today and the Underground Railroad. Um, not long ago in a classroom, I was talking about um, some of the some of the dramas, like the uh, William and Ellen Craft drama and the Anthony Burns drama. And I was talking about the biracial reaction of, of spectators, bystanders, um, watching the affront on liberty. And one of my students raised his hand and I, I turned to him and I said, yeah. He said, that's what we're doing today in the George Floyd incident. And uh, to me, that related what the stories have passed down, perhaps, of the Underground Railroad and the learned striving for freedom that uh, Brian was talking about just a few moments ago. And this student was relating to the Underground Railroad that way. And it did great meaning uh, for him in terms of relevance today. Good. I mean, thank you. I, I, as I think about this, I'm, does the Underground Railroad and their participants, do they have a, a real impact on either country in terms of how they operate, where they go, what happens to them? I'm sort of curious. Irene, you sort of alluded to some of it that their presence allows some changes to take place. I'm curious if you had to sort of pause for a minute and think about how the Underground Railroad in, in the United States or in Canada impacted that environment, that culture, that way of life. What might you say to a classroom of students eagerly looking to you for guidance? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to answer that and then I want to circle back to something Fergus just said, okay. if I can. Sure. Um, you know, it, I, I would say that um, our Underground Railroad story and the people who are involved in the Underground Railroad um, are understood in many ways to be of such national historic significance that they are, they sort of form the nucleus of our beliefs about ourselves as a society. And mm -hmm. I have to say that in Canada, we have a tendency to view ourselves in contrast to our closest and largest neighbor. And sometimes it's very simplistic. Sometimes it's very oversimplified, like we're good, they were mean. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it is very much a sort of part of our self-concept and our identity. And many people will speak of these underground railroad stories and these the grander, broader story of the underground railroad as being sort of, um, the prime representation of what Canada is and has become and has always strived to be. It's much more complicated than that, obviously. But, you know, it, it is held up to students, especially as something that we should admire and strive to uphold in terms of those values and principles and mm -hmm. making sure mm -hmm. that we continue to be a welcoming nation more so than we were in real life. <laughs> um, and, and so I think, you know, that mythology is kind of aspirational and beautiful in some ways, but it does rob the individuals of their agency and their hard work and their right. effort to create and sustain these new lives in Canada and to continue forcing issues around racial segregation. You know, when I look at um, records of those early pioneer families that came on the Underground Railroad, and I see how quick they were to confront racism, to demand access to mm -hmm. education for their kids, mm -hmm. to get involved in petitions and letter writing and using the courts to truly create new lives in freedom, you know, not just legal freedom, but access to opportunities, access to equal education, all of that stuff, like that's part of the story that has to be told too. It really tells us about 
the character and just the magnificence of these individuals who made their way here and, and created these new lives. To a point that Fergus mentioned earlier, I think there is a lot of tremendous work being done right now to recover yeah. those underground railroad stories and we wanna keep that going. I'm not sure how much of that is filtering into the average K to 12 classroom uh, though. I think that there are still a lot of people who are kind of trained the old way, who sort of remember what they were were taught about the Underground Railroad who aren't necessarily able to um, claim ownership of or, or make maximum use of this new scholarship. And so it's incumbent on all of us really to keep finding ways to make that knowledge filtered down to classrooms, to kids, so yes. that they are yeah. hearing the true stories that we now know so much better. I'd agree entirely. And I, one of the projects, some of the people here on the panel are involved in is the uh, Park Service here in the United States is in fact, in the process of creating a new volume on the Underground Railroad that looks off, tries to offer a new perspective and new information as, as Fergus has referred to that's emerged over the last 20 years to help us better understand that, uh, that, that experience and, and what it means and the importance of it. So I would agree. and. Um, Hopefully, uh, summer things might be happening on your side of the border as well, in order to help uh, uh, to do that. Carolyn, hand up, huh? I really didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm very oh, sorry. Excited. I've been involved peripherally a little tiny bit in the project that Irene and Kim were speaking to about this incredible curriculum, this binational curriculum that's being developed. And I, I had very little to do with it, I just helped a little bit, but I wanted to talk about a new project too, because it speaks directly what you're saying, Spencer, and what Irene was saying about the lack of up-to-date, really good information in the schools, but also information that teachers know is there in the schools on a national basis. And um, some colleagues and I were talking about this, I think we've all been talking about this for 20 odd years and more, and uh, we just got a chance to do it. Um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Cooper, who is at Dalhousie University, is the principal investigator. She's a well-known Canadian historian of African Canadian history. She's a poet. She's an author. Um, the other, there's three of us, other us on the group. It's um, Ontario Black History Society president Natasha Henry, who's a well-known educator, teacher, master's in education, and doing her PhD right now. Uh, historian, curator, author, freedom seeker, descendant, and relative of Irene Moore Davis. At uh, Brian, is she related to you too? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, she's involved with this and myself as a senior research fellow, um, and I bring other perspectives, particularly archaeological, to the group. Um, we are charged with a new project by the Department of Canadian Heritage. It is the largest grant ever given for African Canadian history in this country called a Black People's History of Canada. Mm. You know, mm. The objective is to write a book, so we'll have a parallel volume to yours, which is, I brought this up now. Um, it's going to be based on new research being conducted by students with us working oh, across great. The from coast to coast to coast. Um, and we are going to gather that primary resource material and have it available in a database. And then we are charged with creating partnerships with community organizations, mm -hmm. historians, and government agencies across this country in order to create new curriculum ready, classroom ready curriculum that is appropriate to each age group in every province because it's different in every province and territory. Um, and that is the objective of this. So we actually, it's a three-year project. We're actually uh, seeking additional funding right now because we think it's a much longer project than that. And it has so many potential spin-offs and we will be asking everybody on this panel and a lot of people who are going to be watching us today to join with us in a Black People's History in Canada to produce this important material. That's Thank exciting. I, I wish you all the best. Uh, it's, it's my task at this stage to offer each of you a chance to offer some summary thoughts uh, about the Underground Railroad, about what we've talked about today, so that those who are listening in to us can have some words of wisdom to leave with. So I open the floor up to whomever would like to speak first. Or, okay, Dr. Brian. Hey, th thank you, Dr. Crew, and, and certainly, you know, I thank the Wilson uh, Center for uh, uh, allowing me humbly to have a, a chance to break historical bread. Uh, I, I'm going to close by by saying that I, I personally feel that we have much to be thankful for as descendants of the Underground Railroad, 
but the devil would like to make us feel that we don't. When in essence, all we have to do is remind ourselves of what our ancestors went through, literally as my 102 year old aunt Stella Butler said, running through the woods at night, hiding by day, kneeling down and drinking rainwater from the hoofprints of cattle yeah. so that they and, and their descendants could have the opportunity to be on a panel discussion such as this mm -hmm. today. And I suggest to you that this is what progress is all about. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you for those words. Others? Yes, Kimberly. And then Gordon. I just want, I just like to add that um, you asked, the first question you asked was how does, uh, how did the Underground Railroad and the fact that I am a descendant tied to, to who I am now Yes. And I just wanted to say that after a very long career in corporate America, 15 years ago, I decided mm. to take a journey. And the journey has been long, mm. not over yet. And it involves several members of this panel. And it uh, has a, it's a long tunnel. But uh, we started talking about World Heritage designation for our river. Mm. Uh, in, mm, Carolyn will probably correct me, but I'll say somewhere in the neighborhood of about 2005, uh, we cre I created an organization called the Detroit River Project, and uh, it rests uh, with that organization's mission is to create a World Heritage designation That's for true. our river. Uh, for all these lovely stories that Dr. Walls and Irene and Dr. Frost and I have related, um, to honor uh, the participants uh, crossing our river and to honor the stories that we are all attempting to educate our kids. Uh, and for that matter, the kids, the, the adults um, who didn't get this education about the movement of to toward freedom. Uh, so this has been a long journey and it's a journey that I literally walked out of corporate America and decided to jump into. Mm. And, um, and worthwhile, every, every moment I wake up, okay. there's something mm -hmm. else that goes on. So I think that uh, this, uh, I, I, the Wilson Center for allowing me come and present a little bit of what, what I do and what has been going on. But this story needs to be world have a world presence because that's what it is this yeah. is the beginning of the civil move of the civil rights movement in the world uh organized so um i i thank my fellow panelists and uh i agree with everything that's been said today so um <laughs> thank you so much i appreciate it thank you thank you uh, others anything you'd like gordon yes sir uh, I, I would take a very basic approach. It is the Underground Railroad is so exciting and so passion generating that if all of us just talk to a few people every week about it, we are going to make the progress that Dr. Walls uh, Talk about. is looking for. Uh, Fergus. Yeah, I, I, I think I kind of summarized some of my thoughts in my last, last intervention. So I just want to once again, thank the Wilson Center uh, and to thank uh, the Canadian Embassy for making this conversation possible. And Spencer, I, I want to thank you for so deftly riding herd on us for the last uh, hour and a half or so. And uh, uh, it was a great pleasure to hear everyone else, yes, uh, several of whom I, I don't know personally uh, on this call and have been um, really brought up to much greater speed on, on things that are happening elsewhere. And it, it's very, very heartening, even inspiring uh, to, to, uh, to be reminded, to realize uh, how this, this re let's call it a movement, if I may, uh, of rediscovery is, is, is uh, proliferating. Uh, out into society from something that had been essentially forgotten. Right. Yes. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Uh, are there other thoughts or 
I have a couple small thoughts that I want to add. First of all, I just want to thank all of you on the panel. You have been, I think, uh, very op open and honest, and I think very informative for those who are listening in. Uh, like all of you, I have a very strong passion for the Underground Railroad and what it represents and the kind of example it offers for present day generations. I uh, often like to say it is an illustration of how a group of dedicated individuals through their dedication can make a difference in, a, in a society and change how it sees the world and how it relates to one another. Uh, as you said, an early civil rights movement, one of the earliest that there is around. And that lesson, that information is important for us to share with generations today. In, in part to help them feel that what they're doing to try to create change for social justice is not made out of coming out, come out of nowhere, but has a foundation to it. And that there is a chance for success, but you just need to continue down that road, even with the hardships that it, that it presents. And you all have well represented that. And especially you as the ancestors, I think are illustration of what can follow for the next generations. If you think about how your present day decisions can, can affect the future, it can affect future generations. So I'm so grateful to all of you for your time, for your sagacity in this conversation. And I think those who've had a chance to listen in have learned a great deal. And also to thank the Wilson Center and the Canadian Embassy for their willingness to bring this together, to bring us together so we can talk to one another we connect in many kinds of ways, but also share what we know with others in hopes that they will spread it outward as well. So with that, I will turn it back to Christopher and he will wrap us up. Well, there's not much I can add after that wonderful conclusion, except to say thank you to all of you, Spencer Crew, Carolyn Smarts Frost, Fergus Bordwick, Brian Walls, Gordon Baker, Irene Moore Davis, Kimberly Simmons, each of you shared your stories with us and I felt like I was at a, a great family reunion. There's so many connections among you. Uh, it's a conversation a lot of people need to hear. As someone who follows Canada-US relations, not to be too grand, I think that the Canada-US relationship is a friendship between the people of Canada and the United States and the politicians we have from time to time are stewards of that but they don't run the relationship. And as long as we remember that we are tied as people and as friends and as family, Canada-US relations will be in good, good shape. Uh, but that comes down to you. And you've reminded us of a very powerful connection. And I'm very grateful to all of you. For those of you who are watching, this, will, this program will be available as a recording right here at the same site. Tell your friends to come on back and, uh, and watch it as many times as you'd like. Uh, it has been a pleasure to have you all. And so on behalf of the Woodrow Wilson Center, I want to say thank you one more time and uh, have a great afternoon.